In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's number one ranked fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions that are asked by listeners and viewers just like you. But the way we open the episode is by talking about current events. We'll bring up studies. We have a lot of fun. That's the intro portion of this episode. That's 39 minutes long. After that, we get into the mm. fitness questions. We By the way, trash. if you want to see the episode as it's timestamped, so you can fast forward to your favorite part, go to mindpumppodcast.com. So let me give you a breakdown of the episode. We open up by talking about morning moodiness. I had a little experience of that with my daughter this morning. She can't wait Yikes. till she becomes a teenager. Then we talked about bullies, our experience with bullies, and the potential value of bullies. Uh, we talked about a show on Netflix called My Octopus Teacher. Uh, Justin and Adam are having a good time watching that. Yeah, a little uncomfortable. I talked about a good website I think is very valuable these days called allsides.com. This is where you can find your news source and see which side it leans towards to see if you're being uh, unbiased with your opinion. Uh, then we talked about the bike wars, the workout bike wars, Peloton, Amazon, Apple, Who's going to win? Our bet is on Peloton. Then I talked about a company who just IPO'd Compass Pathways. This is a pharmaceutical company that's trying to produce psychedelic medication, legal psychedelic medication for treatment. That's kind of interesting. Ray, Justin's super excited because it's yoga pant season. Fall is here. That also means pumpkin spice. Hey there. Everything. By the way, Organifi, which makes amazing organic supplements, now has pumpkin spice flavored gold juice. This is what you take at night, relaxes your body, gives you great sleep, tastes amazing. Mix it with almond milk. It's incredible. Pumpkin spice is their new flavor. By the way, because you listen to Mind Pump, you get 20% off any product from Organifi. Here's how you get that discount. Go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump. Get 20% off everything in their store with the code Mind Pump. Then we talked about Halloween, whether or not that's going to happen or if it's going to be canceled. Uh, Adam they can't stop us. Talked about using tea tree oil on his scalp. Scalp. That's how he says it on his scalp. Scalping. Uh, by the way, uh, Doctor Squatch makes incredible products, including shampoos that have tea tree oil in them. Great for dry scalp due to fungus or bacteria, or if you have dandruff. All natural, no chemicals. Smells amazing. And uh, like a manly musk. You get 20% off all their products because you listen to Mind Pump. Here's what you do. Go to Dr. Squatch, that's D-R-S-Q-U-A-T-C-H dot com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump for 20% off. And then Justin talks about going to the movies in the COVID era. era. Then we got into the fitness questions. Here's the first question that we answered. What is contralateral training and who does it benefit? Here's the next question. Is alkaline water uh, valuable? Is there any applications for water that advertises itself as alkaline? The next question, is foam rolling good for recovery? And the final question, in our opinion, how credible are personal trainers if they're not in the best shape? So the chubby trainers, do they have a lot of value? Mm. Uh, also, look, uh, Mind Pump produces workout programs that can, can be followed online. Uh, we have some of the most popular workout programs available anywhere. They're called MAPS Fitness Products. We have a lot of different MAPS programs, okay? We have programs for people who like to train like bodybuilders. We have programs for beginners, people who want to work on their functional mobility, a lot of different kinds of programs. Now, what makes a workout program effective partially is if it's the right program for you. What is your current fitness level? What are your goals? What do you want to work on? Follow the right program, get great results. Follow the wrong, wrong program, get bad results. Now, all MAPS programs are written and created by three trainers with a combined experience training real people of over 60 years. We know what we're doing. We're not just celebrity trainers. No. We're real trainers. In fact, we were real trainers well before we got on social media. So you know the workouts work. Also, all MAPS programs let you try them out for a full month uh, and- Within that month, if it doesn't do what you think it's supposed to do for you, you can get a full refund. So they're risk-free, okay? If you want to check out all of our MAPS programs to find out what's best for you, just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Again, that's mapsfitnessproducts.com. Scalp it. Dude, yeah. I uh, had a terrible realization this morning. Mm. So I'm the oldest of four kids, right? Mm. I remember distinctly, maybe you remember this too, Adam, because you're the oldest of uh, a bunch of kids too. 
I remember distinctly my sisters going from sweet and happy most of the time to completely unpredictable and crazy a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm. I remember. I was right around 11 or 12, and it was just like, what happened? You know, and I wasn't really old enough to understand. <laughs> my daughter's 11, and the uh, the morning moodiness Ooh. is just, yeah, this morning was a good time. Oh, it hasn't even fully set in Th- there, That's bro. my pro- That's yeah. what I'm- <laughs> it's, She's just warming up. That's the fear, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like, literally, it's it, yesterday, just like cuddly, <laughs> hugging dad. Oh, I love you. It's so great. This morning- you know, she wakes up, come downstairs. Oh, hey, honey. I go to give her a kiss. Get away from me. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, what did I do? You bite your hand I think off. my sister- Like, what did I do? My sister and I were pretty inseparable till we were about 12, I think. So right before high school was the main, main divergence, right? So once we hit high school- Oh, you guys weren't cool in high school? No, we were just so different, right? So she was, even though we're only one year apart, I'm sure she'll check me on the dates on this because she like remembers, this is like vivid memories for her, like, yeah. right? When, <laughs> when we like- when, when I was like, I'm going my own way. Well, we were, we're only, we're only uh, you know, we're only what, 13 months apart from each other. But because she's in December and I'm in early November, uh, she's, we're two grades apart from each other. But so growing up as kids, we we played with each other all the time. We were best of friends. And then I think junior high, uh, when she was in junior high still, I was making my way into high school. That gap was enough. And, you know, once you get into high school, like I'm too cool to hang out with my little sister. And so I probably wasn't hanging out very much with her. And then when she gets to high school, she literally like resents like every person that I hang out with, the type of person I hang out with. Like she was like anti the athlete and cheerleaders. And that, that was like totally my, my so, life. So from your perspective, she's punk rock. She's the totally. one. She was, she did my, she, my sister went through an all, like my cousin. all yeah. black face. You know yeah. what I'm saying? <laughs> she went through that. Like yeah. she was, she was like the, out of the two of us, I would say she was the, the bad one in school. Like I was the goody goody kid, right? <laughs> mm. She was like the bad one. She was one. the bad kid. The and, rebel. I, and I swear she did that because uh, it was just because she went the opposite direction as me. I, I, st- I feel, I'm sure she'll clear this up because I, I know her. She's such a like you wouldn't think. Yeah, that. she's like a sweetheart. What? You got, my sister has got an edge to her, bro. Oh, uh, I could, uh, I could see I that mean, maybe a little bit. But yeah, like, if like, I had to, if I knowing both of you, if I had to guess, I mean, you know the sweet side because she handles customer service, right? So you guys see that she's like, oh, man, she's so good with our people and stuff. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you don't want to cross my sister, dude. I don't, I don't, I don't think that. But if, knowing the both of you, if I had to label one of you uh, an asshole. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna put it on you. I would say Adam. No, yeah, I'm sure. sure she likes that, yeah, but no, <laughs> no. So Raise my your hand my theory my theory is that that two year gap, right? So because we were like I said, inseparable to like twelve of me getting into high school and becoming too cool, right, to hang out with my little sister. I think that built up animosity. So then when she came into high school, it was like evaluate like who my brother is, who he hang, he hangs out with, like the group, the clique. And then she like identified with the complete opposite, you know. Uh, do they now? Do they still do? Are clicks still a thing in school? Like they were when? Because we, when yeah. I was when we were in school, well, I, you're the one with the high schooler, so sure. you would know better than anybody. Yeah, yeah but it's uh, it doesn't seem as strong. And but I don't know if it's just my little you know slice of my kids' school because mm-hmm. I remember being in school and they were distinct like. The stoners hang out over there. Yeah, that's the, the, the goth kids are in the parking lot. There's the skaters. There's the yeah. goth kids, and you know right. it was very, very segregated. You know, yeah. was it like that? It was like the nerds years, right? are around the library. Yeah. yeah, no, it was definitely like Justin that. Justin looks at me. When he's yeah. Saying, right? yeah. <laughs> I yeah, think they're yeah. more inclusive now, right? I think that, that that's like such oh, a Oh, they're so much nicer now. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I think it's such yeah. I think that's more of a more of a message now that in, in school. Maybe that's, th- maybe that's what it is. It's like now the you have the inclusive kids over here <laughs> and then everybody yeah. else is over there. Yeah. You know? Maybe it. uh yeah. Do you think there's any benefits to the the, the meanness? I think there's a little bit of learning I from do. that. I mean <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just, no, I just I, I think that like this is preparing you for outside life. Like people are not always going to be nice to you. Like, how do you deal with that? I talk about this with my kids all the time. Cause there's like this one kid, uh, Ethan, my oldest, like he's, he's had a really hard time with, and of course he gets paired with this kid in every class, like the last three years. Oh, wow. And so you didn't have to fight him. Well, and he gets like, <laughs> dude, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to do a good job parenting here. Yeah, 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 exactly. like, You're yeah, going to yeah. have to fight him, son. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I'm like, look, you're going to have people like this your whole life. Like, you don't want to hang out with them. Like, they're going to interject and, like, butt their way in and, you know, like, be rude and uh, try and blame you for things. Like, that's just, like, human nature. Like, you got to figure out how you're going to be able to deal with this because, uh, you know, this is, some, this is something that you're going to see later on in life as well. So, it's been tough, though, because it's, I mean, he's learned how to deal with it and, and how to basically, uh, uh, tell him like, look, I don't appreciate this. And he's like very much more like in his face about it. And then the guy's leaving him alone. Mm. And so it's been a good learning lesson. But again, like if, if it was, if I was another parent, I'd be like in there like, no, you can't have this kid in class with him. My kid shouldn't, you know, suffer because this kid's being an asshole. Yeah. I feel like Sal's more likely to get defensive like that. I feel like he would be more protect. He has more of that like uh, protective uh, side well, of him. Well, so right, have you, you have to be smart about it, though. You know what I mean? Like if you go in and you tell the what teacher, do you mean, like you hire like a hitman for the kid. Well, or like you go take his knees, like out. you go intimidate the other kids' <laughs> Nancy parents. Yeah, you know what I mean? So like I would, I I'd find the <laughs> you go threaten the, dad. the bully's parents, <laughs> and then I'd go threaten him and be like, if your kid, you know, I'm gonna have to kick your. Head. No, yeah. that's not what. You, did I ever tell you guys about the time that I I advised one? So I had a client that I trained, and she brought me her son to train, and the kid was 13 years old. And one of the reasons why she she had me train him is to build his confidence. And part of that was because he would get bullied at school. So I'm training this kid and I'm trying, I'm just focusing on fitness. I'm making, and I know what fitness does. If you do it right, you don't even have to preach. It just does build confidence. But this kid would confide in me about these, these kids. And there was one in particular that really used to bully him pretty bad. And the mom, she was a single mom, very successful though. And she would go and talk to the school, but this kid was a real piece of shit. I mean, really just bullied. So he would tell me stories. So, and I'm now I'm getting emotionally invested in this kid because he's my client. He's right. kind of like a little, you know, my, like I feel like he's my little brother, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm giving him advice now at, at some point. And he's like, yeah, he, he follows me because I, 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 he would say, what, do I, what should I do? This kid always bothers me, says things. He pushes my books off the desk. I'm like, well, your mom's, you know, talking to school or, you know, what's going on? I said, well, maybe you should ignore him. And he goes, he follows me home from school. He rips my backpack off my back. He pushes me. So he's telling me this. And one day, he, the kid followed him home from school and pushed him down. And then he got up and just walked away. So I'm like, oh, man, I hope I don't regret this. But I said, okay, here's, here's what maybe you can do this. I said, next time he's following you, turn around and tell him you're not going to move. Say, I'm not going to move. Don't come near me. I'm not going to move. And put your arm out. If he gets close enough to where you could touch him, hit, hit him in the face as hard as you can <laughs> and send him a message. And so, and I said it a little bit better than that. So he did it. The kid, he stopped. He said, I'm not going to move. He put his arm out. The kid came close. He hit the kid in the face. They got in a fight. Mom got all pissed off. Oh my God, my son, this and that. But guess what happened? Never bother him. Yeah, never, didn't never mess never, with him again. Never bother well, him. Lots of things. Just being assertive and standing your ground. That's that's the biggest thing. And that's yeah. like when, when they face that, and like you're something that's not going to be moved so easily, then you know they'll they'll back off. They they want an easy target. Yeah. Or you'll get jumped like I did several times or in that. junior high. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work so well for me. Yeah, it builds that character, me in high right? School too, it builds dude. character, don't you exactly. think? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It, it toughens you up a little bit. It gave me a little bit of a reputation. So Ethan has dealt with it then, huh, Justin? Yeah, you, yeah. this kid's a real... Uh, you know, punk, and and it's been it's been a headache. Say for his us. name on the podcast. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. He's already dealt with him like a few times and had physical uh, interactions with him, and and has been able to now get him completely to leave him alone. Now I'm not there yet. So what's that feeling like? Is it now? Do you see him like Pete, ter uh, teacher parent conference things or yeah? So here's shit? the thing. I th there's always a background story, right? So uh, again, this is also why I like Cobra Kai, and you know, not to <laughs> just keep bringing it up. <laughs> But <laughs> what, dude? They showed Johnny's background. What I'm trying to say is, this kid it's a, it's, has shitty a, there's parents. There's a life analogy in hey, Cobra he's Kai. Empath for he's empathizing with his son's bully. The, the, the kid <laughs> has shitty parents, okay, and, and, yeah, yeah. and you enough. know, there's probably abuse there. Sure. Something of course, going on, of course, totally. And so I realize that, and so I, I'm, I'm trying to then tell you know Ethan this kind of stuff without saying it, like you know specifically, but you know he probably doesn't have the best you know home to go back to, and is looking for ways to take it out, and and so. So, you know, you see 
see that when we go to these parent teacher conferences and stuff like this guy, like it's just a real piece of work, you know? And it's like, I, at first I got like mad and I was going to like, you know, just like, like, I, like I was going to confront him, you know, and be this like, Hey, this your kid's an asshole, you know, like in, and but like I saw him like, Oh wow. Like this guy is, is a real piece of work. Dude. This isn't the same it. guy who was like smoking weed on like the, the high school, like thing. Remember you told a story one time oh, about yeah. like one of the dads, you guys were all going somewhere. And is that like, that dad? No, that's a, he does another winner. That's, dad. that's one we just, you know how it's a, okay. So as a parent, you kind of just cut off like certain like little friends of theirs. Like, Oh yeah. Yeah. You're not going over to that kid's house. <laughs> yeah. No, no, his dad's a, an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a juggling act because, uh, as a parent, you, nothing will invoke your protective feelings like your kid, yeah. you know, something happens to your kid. You, you, you just, you know, <clears throat> Papa bear comes out, but it's a juggling act. Do I say something? And then run the risk of my kid looking like they can't handle themselves, being a tattletale, right? You know that kind of stuff. Uh, it, there's also value in your kid figuring out, especially when they're. In, see, here's the thing: when they're in elementary school, maybe junior high. What's the worst that can happen? And it depends on the situation. But what's the worst that can happen? They get a shiner, maybe they get a bloody lip or whatever. But there's a lesson learned. Once they get older, if they don't learn that lesson younger. Then it can become more and more dangerous. They turn into extremists. Yeah, so you start. You got to start. You got to balance all of that out. Like, what do I? What do I do? What I do feel I say? like. Ju- I mean, I, I. I don't know because I'm not. I'm not there yet, right? I, I feel like I would handle it similar to what you did, Justin. I think that uh, no one told me this. Like, I went through that, right? So I've shared getting bullied and jumped and all that when I was a kid. Um, for, for your small calves. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm sure it was. <laughs> no, they matched at Always that age. Them you know them that <laughs> at that age, they matched. You know what I'm saying? It's small everything. You know right. Skin is like a buck 35. Oh, right? man, I yeah. feel bad. I'm just kidding. <laughs> as long as you got a good jump shot, yeah. you're fine. No, no. So, uh, you know, I, I, I got uh, all that when I was younger. And, you know, uh, there wasn't a lot of coaching from my parents or conversation around it. It was just I, I figured it out. I dealt with it myself. And I think uh, understanding, believe it or not, the the bullies and probably how unfortunate they are, and what and that's why it caused it, probably would have gave me a different perspective, right? Like when you're a kid, yeah. you don't see that. When you're a kid, you just see this kid who's an asshole and he's a punk. And a lot of times, kids actually think that that kid's probably cool or popular because everybody's scared of him, and so everybody respects him type of deal. Where it's like. When you start to kind of open their eyes a little bit, like, son, you know, he, he probably has parents that don't love him. Mm-hmm. You know, he probably has a shitty bed he's got to sleep in. You know, he's probably got to deal with all. When you let him, like, kind of understand that, like, part of what makes this kid this way is a reflection of him not liking himself or not liking his situation. I feel like I was a smart enough kid that if you would have, like, taught me that, I'd probably have a different yeah, perspective. Unless he uses it, you know? Yeah, like yeah kids yeah. bully him. Hey, your dad's an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> My dad told me. <laughs> you might get a family. Oh, yeah. You know? I didn't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This kid starts crying. Oh, he is an uh, alcoholic. Why? How'd you find out? Yeah, and it's just control. You yeah. have no control at home. It makes you feel powerful, and you have control when you can exert it somewhere else. Right, right, That's right. That's where, you know... I had one the, one of the kids that jumped me in, in junior high, I ran into him like four, three, four years ago what? As, as an adult, and he's a pastor. Shut and up. He came up to me at the grocery store. Wow. He walks up to me. He's like, hey, Sal, you remember me? And I'm like, of course I remember. In my head, I'm like, yeah, of course I remember you, piece of shit. But I didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm like, no, man, I don't remember you. And he's like, hey, man, I want to apologize. I know I was an asshole. And in junior high, I'm really sorry I did all that, and so he must have like wow, remembering yeah. all the way back to junior high. Oh, it was a big deal, dude. They, they they cornered me in this in the bathroom. It was like five of them, yeah, and they yeah. all took turns, and I was just doing my best to defend myself the whole time. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, and like, then he ends up being a pastor later on. Ends up becoming a pastor. And wow, comes in a, in that's a, wild. And a, the a, guilt apologizes <laughs> to me. Yes. Hey, Justin, I watched that uh, that octopus. Fucking documentary yes. last weekend. What's it called? Isn't so, that the, the the most awkward uh, show yeah, on so, Netflix right now? Uh, My octopus teacher. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I want to watch that. So, what's the deal with it? Well, that? okay. So, actually, it's it's fascinating in a weird way. Okay, so th- it it actually gets into octopus behavior and like how intelligent they are. And I think that there's really not a lot of behavioral study around octopuses. And so he he went through all the stuff in his life and he made it about like kind of the drama and stuff that he was experiencing. And like when he was a kid, he really liked to go diving in, uh, you know, these kelp beds and stuff. And like, he used to do this as a kid. And so he remembered that. And so he started doing that again and decided to do this like every day and would visit this one specific area every day and saw this octopus and like kind of befriended it in a weird way. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, they, they had a moment where they actually like had a connection, like the octopus came out of its den and, 
and then put its tentacles like on its hand and they kind of connected and then it started to like would see him and like like swim over to him and like land on his chest and like hug him and all this like weird stuff it sounds yeah. like weird anime oh yeah. dude it was <laughs> like know? cephalopod love it <laughs> was it was a little weird it was it, you know yeah. we we watched it because so we were at uh sanctuary this weekend and which means max is sleeping in the same room as we are and it's like I don't know. He goes to bed at like seven thirty, eight o'clock when we're out there, and like it's eight o'clock at night, or it's a weekend, and he's in the room with us, and you're in the we're in this, you know, they're, they're like little single studios yeah. right on the beach or whatever. And I'm like, fuck, I, I can't watch TV right now. So like, build all this thing to like cover the light so we could still try and watch TV. And Katrina's like, you can't watch anything violent or crazy. Or I'm like, oh my god, what's on TV that's not <laughs> any of those things, right? Yeah, I'm like, right. Uh, so we find that, and I'm watching that. So it's perfect. It's slow. It's quiet and. Katrina hates all that that uh, all the you know nature shit that I watch, and so I'm all into it watching it. Yeah, well, I watch it with the boys. They're they're all about it. Yeah, the the thing that was uh, your point, right? I don't think very many people have taken the time to try and uh, befriend an octopus like this guy did. This guy <laughs> yeah. does this for like it took the, what Justin's talking about. I think it took he tracks the days, right? Like mm -hmm. I think it's like two three months in of every single day coming down in the same place. And letting this octopus like build trust and getting closer and closer to him until yeah. eventually he reaches out and kind of touches him, and then and he like loses trust at one point, and like uh, he tries to like intervene and save it from like this shark that's trying to eat it, and like he's trying to be like a you know like an observer and not like inter interfere with like this whole ecosystem and whatnot, and uh, but it just got it, it was. It was fascinating, but also it's like him saying it and like how he feels about the octopus got real weird. Like he started to dream about it and like all this stuff. And you're just like, dude, what else? Well, so you know the, I mean? yeah, the, the things that I'm like, okay, so if we get sucked in because we're watching this octopus and it's like kind of fascinating, like you don't see anything. And he brings up at the very beginning, like his relationship with his son. And I can't help but think like, because mm -hmm. they don't talk about any of that. Like his, it's not about this guy. It's all about this octopus. And I'm like, Dude, this dad, okay, has got a son who looks like, like anthropomorphizing his son. Or misplaced, yeah. misplaced yeah. empathy. Misplaced, yeah. yeah, dude, totally. I mean, he's and when you see like the amount of research that goes in this, this guy spends all day, all night thinking about this octopus. He's got massive charts on his wall of yeah. where it was at this time, and like, <laughs> yeah. oh, it's crazy. Oh yeah, for sure, the and, obsession's real. And I feel like nobody, like you're the the person who's you know editing this or filming this, like I, they don't ever ask that question. Like, what about the rest of your life, dude? Yeah. Like, this yeah. is all this guy is doing. We're all so fascinated by the octopus and the story of that. I'm sitting there going like, this dude's got to have a fucked up life, dude. Like, Imagine his, yeah. his, his and then son the camera guy. This. Yeah, right? <laughs> the camera guy's like, "Here we go again." You know? <laughs> <laughs> he's like filming him in, in his room after he's done. He's like, "I probably should turn the camera off." <laughs> his son. I think watched, we're done here. His yeah. son's watching the, doc the documentary. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Dad, yeah. dad missed his weekend with me, and he's yeah. hanging out with, <laughs> with an octopus. That's what I feel like. I want to totally. see the follow up. Right? Well, we're, dude, we're, you know, hum we're very complex. Uh, humans are very complex, and we have this this really strong feelings of empathy. Actually, Actually, in fact, yesterday I was watching uh, puppy videos with my daughter last night before she got moody this morning, and we're watching these puppy videos, and you can't help, when you see a puppy, you can't help but think they're extremely adorable. When you learn about the theories behind evolution, because you know, dogs and humans have, been, have worked together for a very, very long time, and they think that dogs uh, uh, slowly evolved these puppy features to look cute to us. So they evolved to look cute so that we would take care of them. What? As, it's true. Think about it. How many animals do you look at in baby form and think they're cute? Not a whole lot. Some of them you do. Puppies got to be at the top. Other animals and like well, a spider that's a baby. Any, dogs are cute. crazy because it's like you, you literally see coming from a wolf, like what we've done to, to, to wolves. You ever, you ever seen those memes? Like a little chihuahua, you know, like <laughs> what the fuck? How did we do that? There's there's a meme with a wolf and it's like, you know, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go hang out with those humans next to the fire. What's the worst that could happen? And then the next picture <laughs> is a pug with like a birthday candle yeah, hat on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's in a little like uh, one of those like Louis Vuitton bags. Yeah. It's like, well, what's going on what's, now? What's the yeah. worst that could happen? You used to be cool. Yeah. Really? Yesterday, I was also uh, going on a walk with the kids, and uh, my son has definitely inherited some of my, I don't know, annoying qualities, mm. or he likes to debate everything. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. So we're going for a walk, and I don't care what <laughs> subject comes up, 
he has to argue oh God. his side. But it's fun because him and I... He's, now, ex- you, he's exercising. Now, do you engage or do you coach a little bit? Of that? Like, son, this is kind of a turnoff for most people. I love doing this with you, but not, most yeah. people are not going to love this. In that quality situations, of us. might not want to go with this. Well, <laughs> in case to his credit... He didn't. He didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. No, he, no. Double down, he's son. Too, he's too busy trying to argue his point. Yes, yeah. exactly. No, dude. no, no. To his credit... <laughs> Forget coaching that. Hey, bro, this might get you beat up, bro, in school. <laughs> <laughs> well, to his credit, he's open. Okay. He'll let he'll let you go back and forth, but he always has a counterpoint, and he does a good. Even though he's misinformed, but he's young, right? He's only fifteen. He has good points that he makes, and so we can go back and forth and debate. And so what ends up happening sometimes is I'll I'll I could tell that I've got some of his gears turning, but instead of being like that's a good point, he hasn't learned that yet. Mm. Instead, he just stops. Okay, mm. I don't want to talk about it anymore. So like that. <laughs> okay, I'm done here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> only fun when I win. Change the subject, yeah. you know. What were you guys debating? I mean, what was it? Get what? Did- uh, oh man, we got into economics. Uh, we talked about the electoral college and the potential value. So I don't want you know bore you guys with the the details, but you know he's making some good points. I can see what he's trying to say, and so I'm making my points, and we're going back. And it was literally it was literally an hour debate about a couple subjects and i could tell jessica was yeah. really trying not to pull her hair out because well, she can hear the, it's cool know. as a parent to see how they think though right like, i love it yeah you get to kind of find out what's like brewing in their mind and and see like you know where to kind of steer them in the right direction oh dude and speaking of which there's a great website i just found and i'll recommend this to our audience it's called allsides.com and if you go there it literally will rank news sources on their bias. Mm -hmm. So you can go on there, look up your favorite news channel, uh, you know, ABC, NBC, Reason Magazine, you know, uh, Fox, whatever, and it'll tell you where they rank (coughs) in terms of their bias. And then on the site, there's tests that you can take to see what your bias is. Mm. So it's it's a great tool because what I think you should do is go on there Look up your news sources that you love to read the most. Do a self test on your own on yourself, and then purposely read the stuff that's on the opposite side, just so you could challenge yourself. Yeah, see this. See there it is. You could see the the left lean left, center lean right, and right, and where everything is. Do you it's agree? actually center? Yeah, I just feel like is like, it anything center? There's to nothing. Them? Yeah, that's not doesn't come with a bias. Well, so I try to check myself because it, when I look at this chart, to me. They put Reason Magazine in lean right. Now, Reason is libertarian. I think that's very center. Mm-hmm. So I try to check myself and think, well, is it because I'm because I'm over there more that I think everything's more left or what's the actual deal? Right. But nonetheless, use it, you can use this to kind of guide you a little bit. But well, it's really cool because you could type in uh, a site that you're reading articles from and see which direction that they lean and then do your own tests. It's, is that, cool. is that so? I'm, I'm looking that at it cool. right that right now. So I'm assuming that the so you have the center, and then you have the two to the left, two to the right. Are the two closest to the center cl- considered closest to center? Is yeah. That, and the the far outsides are the most extreme. Yeah. So on the very left is left. Yeah. Then it goes left uh, lean. Then it goes center lean right, and then right. So on the extreme right, uh, it's you know Fox News. On the extreme left, CNN, for example. But then in the middle, you have. Uh, like The Hill, USA Today, NPR, uh, Bloomberg. Um, you know, on the lean right, you'll have like Market Watch. On the lean left, you'll have ABC, for example, or Politico. But it's a it's a really really good way for you to check oh, yourself. Market Watch is considered a lean right. I didn't even know that. You know, I thought it was a little neutral, but I guess I don't know. I don't I don't I can't recall. Well, an I'm gonna article. make I'm gonna I'm gonna make a comment, but it could be my own bias. But I guess if you speak economic sense, you may be lean right. <laughs> I mean, I don't. I mean. That may be the case a little bit, you know, being. Yeah, yeah well, anyway. no, speaking of market, no, I was just reading Market Watch this morning. Are you guys watching the bike wars right now? What bike wars? Oh, the, the bike wars, uh, Workout man. home Yeah, bike? that's what I'm going to call so, it. So wait, we got, we got Apple, obviously we got Peloton. Yep. Uh, who else? And now Amazon. So Amazon is now throwing their hat in the ring here. So we have, the, and they are going after like the market, the 499. So I think five, a bike under $500. Uh, they've partnered up with Echelon. And which is the maker of the bike, and they basically are creating something to rival uh, the Peloton bike. And it's, I mean, what, five times cheaper than even the, the newest version of Peloton. We talked about Peloton coming out with a, you know, they partnered up with a new manufacturer so they could produce the bike at a, I think, a 20% reduction of what it was last year or whatever. Uh, even at that twenty percent re- <clears throat> reduction, it's still five times more expensive than the the mm-hmm. Amazon bike that's 
came out for fiber. Now, what I don't know it, because it's so new is you know I don't know how it com- compares to it. Right. One, I know how that, smooth the experience, right. like how integrated everything is. Yeah, because that's, that's what, Peloton. That's exactly because otherwise you just get an exercise bike. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? If right. it's not going to provide all that. So what this tells me is this tells me everything that we've been predicting, which is that the fitness, uh, there's still a huge demand for fitness. It's just shifting. Oh, yeah. And at-home workouts is exploding, and now you have all these major brands. They're trying to figure out how to get in on the action. Absolutely. Yeah. Because I think the future of working out is going to, obviously, we've talked about this so many times, but it's going to look very different. You have Amazon and Apple, big players that usually don't have anything to do with you know, with workout equipment. Yeah. And they're entering into the fray, which yeah. tells you that they see the, the And they're not just originally I used to think that Peloton was just like a, you know, you know, soul cycle at home type of deal, right? I I really thought it was just a bike, but you know, the the software offers all kinds of like workout stuff. So mm-hmm. you can like turn your monitor on your bike, like and you can have your little yoga mat to the side with your pair of dumbbells and follow a trainer through a workout, a weight right. routine. So that I mean that competes it right with Mir and Tonal and the Mir other and ones. Tonal, yeah. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this all all the how they all shape up as far as who has. I, the market I even share. heard whims of like uh, Orange Theory trying to get in on that in terms of like having statistics and things like at home that you could like shoot up to your screen. That's interesting because I, what I, one of the things I was fascinated by with uh, Orange Theory when I was there was what a great job they did with tech. So even during the time that I was there, what four years ago or more? I don't even know how oh, long. Oh, way it's more been. than that. Has it been more than four? Yeah. When we first started. No. No, oh, no, like you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I was there for the first year that's that we right, were still right. starting this, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, they were already doing things where, you know, you were they basically were combining like the the, the Fitbit fill and the connectivity to the, the group and the tracking your score and you could wear it in the class you, and it would sync up to the TV and see to be able to real time see your calorie burn and stuff and then your zones. Then you could go outside and go for a hike and be about your day, and then it would track all your zones for the day. And then, like I said, connect to a community mm-hmm. where you can all be. Honestly, I, I feel Apple and Peloton are going to be, you know, the two juggernauts in this space. Mainly Peloton because they've been doing it the whole time. This is their, you know, wheelhouse. But also Apple's like secretly like have had all these patents and all this tech that's been just mm. sitting there waiting to integrate. Uh, and, and you saw that they just launched their their Apple Watch, like the, the latest version, where there's like all these sophisticated uh, new sensors they put into it. And, you know, it's they're going to have this all, all this like uh, biometric data and all that's going to be on the TV before you know well, it. Well, here's my prediction, okay? Just like in the gym space, it, the equipment in the gym has far less to do with the success of the gym than the workouts that are occurring, the environment, essentially the the feel of the facility would dictate its success way more than the equipment. I think whoever wins this competition is not going to be the one with the best bike or the best equipment. It's the best experience. The best experience, the yeah. best programming, the 100%. best workouts. That's what's going to win. This is where Peloton is crushing. Yeah, It's not necessarily that they have the best bikes. It's that they're programming so far, because things could change. Yeah is the best. So Apple could go in with the coolest bike or whatever, but if you don't have good classes, a good feel, a good environment, it's well, not going to work. Yeah, they got a lot of work to do in that direction. They do. Oh, well, I also think they've already done a good job of building community. That's the to They me, have a lot of people. Yeah, that's to me, that's the first... Once people like something, right, it's really tough to get you to come to something, try something else out. Like if you've been a Peloton person since, it's, since inception and they've just continued to upgrade and get better and get better and get better and you're a part of that community, like getting you to switch over to something just because it's you know mm-hmm. cheaper. I don't see that happening. I, I mean, yeah. I definitely think there's going to be, uh, like many things, I think they'll they'll all get a market share and you're going to have this. Uh, obviously, they're, they're going after different demographics, right? I mean, you have a bike that's $2,500 to $3,000 versus a bike that's $500. I mean, you're you're the type of person that is going to be yeah, able it's to- it's pretty afford. crazy what they're charging for a bike. Yeah. And, and, then you, and then you have a monthly membership on top of that. You yeah. know, Here's the person that, okay, so I don't know. This is my prediction. I, I could totally be wrong, right? But I think the person going for the cheaper bike probably will end up going with a stationary bike and some kind of free programming on TV without yeah. needing to get the expensive integrated bike. People who want the integrated bike- We'll go with the experience, the one that really wins, which would be at this point Peloton. Right. Peloton is, you know, is building. Speaking of companies, um, Compass Pathways went public. So oh, right. this was the company that I know um, had some big investors. They're a pharmaceutical company who have a potential psilocybin, like magic mushroom drug that could get passed um, and right now is in trials. 
So they went public. Of course, they're exploding because there's a lot of excitement around you know this kind of therapy. But it's the first pharma company, I think, that potentially could be using psychedelics to treat legally to treat uh, you know depression, PTSD, and other psychiatric. That's exciting, man. This is very exciting. I think that uh, psychedelics, from what I've seen with the studies, uh, have so much potential to completely transform how some of these people get yeah, treated. Yeah, you see Berkeley, they, uh, I don't know if it's decriminalized or they made it uh, somewhat legal to, to be able to start treating uh, patients with, with psilocybin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just decriminalized right yeah. now, right? It's not legal. No, but Compass Pathways has a, a actual drug that has that can be approved. So it's not, you're just feeding people mushrooms, but rather standardized you know, meeting the standards, I guess. Now, so. do you see them as like kind of like GW as far as like they're the are they the, are they the leaders in this category? Like they, they are the leaders. Um, they just went I IPO and they've so far done well. Um, they don't have any products on market, so it's still a risky investment. But I think the excitement is what's going to drive it at first. But if they get a drug to pass to get if it if it gets fast tracked the way that cannabinoid uh, medications did. Um, you're going to see some exciting stuff. And yeah. because again, the research looks crazy. You know, people with resistant treatment, uh, excuse me, uh, treatment resistant depression, which historically is like, there's nothing we can do. Mm. Some of these studies are showing some remarkable things with psychedelic research in combination with therapy. So this could be a breakthrough. You know what else is exciting yeah. it is yoga pants and Ugg season, dude. Oh, I was yeah. going to bring that up. Yeah. My favorite part about fall. <laughs> Basic <laughs> bitch season. Like oh, yeah. <laughs> pumpkin spice. Everything nice. Oh, uh, yeah. Did you see Organifi drop their pumpkin spice, dude? Watch that thing go crazy. Which, which what is it? The it's their the, gold. Yeah. Oh, so we got to figure out how to froth that into to my latte, dude. It's already. It, I bet you can, I, and I'm sure it tastes amazing. I so bet it does. gold is already like one of my favorite tasting ones that they have, and so now you throw pumpkin spice in there. Look out! Oh, I love yeah. are you guys. Big fans of the pumpkin I like, spice. I, I do like it yeah. secretly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, not so much anymore. But yeah. I, I really. What's going to happen with Halloween this year? Are they going to not? Probably no trick or treating, right? Well, no, well, that was the thing. I guess there was this big debate on that where they were making a hard stance of like we're just canceling uh, Halloween. I think this is like in LA and then people pushed back really hard. And so, uh, I think it's, I think it's still happening, but it's, uh, you know, at, at everybody's discretion. Of course it's going to happen. Yeah. It's still. like, you can't stop. Look it. at the beaches. Yeah. Every time I, every time I get online, like I check before I go down to the beach, it's like, it's closed. Yeah. But you, okay. <laughs> but you I mean, go down there. Do you think it's far from closed? Do you think parents are going to, a, a lot Obviously, of parents are going to take their kids around to houses? Get I think candy. it'll be, I think it'll be a lot less. I think it's going to be a lot less. Yeah. I think it'll be a lot it'll less. It'll be yeah. different. They'll probably put the candy out, you know, on the uh, sidewalk or something and do that whole thing. I don't know what it's going to look like. I just know, well, I'll if throw, you, I'll throw candy yeah. from my door. This is where masks actually make sense. So, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> Well, what are we talking about? With my daughter, we said, look, if it's not happening, then why don't you have a couple friends come over? You guys will dress up anyway. Yeah. We'll watch scary movies together. Well, it's, candy. it's funny, too, and I wasn't going to – well, so my kids decided to pick their own costumes this year, and it was very much a sign of the times and, you know, apocalyptic looking. Like, so <laughs> one, of my, one of my kids, he decided to be like a plague doctor. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, the beak mask. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like, and I'm like, really? This is what you want to go with? I was like, all right, dude. You know, cool. And the other one's like, you know, it, it, like a SWAT. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, dude. <laughs> it's a little volatile right now. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Katrina wanted to dress uh, me, her, and Max all up like Cobra Kai and stuff like that. And I was like, you got to call Justin before you do that. It's been Justin's costume for it's like like every year. Yeah. It's like he's. I think he own. He has that. Yeah, I have the so, patent. Yeah. So. We can't. We, we can't. We can't be that without actually. Getting approval it's funny from. you say that because I was gonna be the. Uh, I'm like the skeleton Johnny this year, and I bought like the you know the whole like like skeleton outfit thing. <laughs> and realize it's too small. Like I can't fit it over my upper body. Like my legs, it's just like saran wrap. But like, so I'm going to have to shred it and like make it work. Wait, it fits your cakes, but not the upper body? Yeah. That's weird. Well, you mean this way, right? It's not right. tall enough? Yeah. You no, can't put it's it not your... wide enough. Oh, really? Yeah. That mm. is weird. Yeah, because normally it's the cakes that don't fit for you. Yeah, apparently a bunch of like little skinny dudes, you know, <laughs> trying to 
pull off to their Johnny. You get well, the, <laughs> do you get the husky size? Or yeah. <laughs> yeah, where's all the husky love? You know what yeah. I mean? Didn't come in that. That's hilarious. <laughs> no. Yeah. So how did that, uh, Adam, I know you 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 were going to test out the the tea tree shampoo for scalp. Oh, no. Actually, I got, um, no, I've been using uh, Dr. Squatch for a while. And recently, I got a, I got a DM. So somebody, so ever since I've been shaving my head, right? I get, it's funny. I get all these uh, bald guys that like fucking message me now. It's like, this was never a how do you, this one's how do you, best for your how do you head co- skin. How do you cope with it? No, you know, totally. Like, I, I, so I don't want to tease, right? So I'm not going to like throw anybody under the bus, but I do get a lot of that. Like, you know, hey, how long did it take you to be okay with it and this and that? Like, no, there's a lot of that. I, I didn't realize how much, uh, I mean, we should know, right? Look at all the marketing. Did you too. bury your hair? No, no. Like, I, like <laughs> a lot, it's a, it's a major, it's a major insecurity for a lot of men and then, now, where I understood, and I think I've shared this on the show before, like what kept me from shaving it a long time ago was my psoriasis, right? So mm-hmm. my dry scalp, and that was, you know, I'm like, I had a shaved head as a kid all the time, so it wasn't a big deal. You say scal- scalp, like like it's scalp. 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 There's an A. Scalping. I know how yeah. I can spell it. Uh, scalp or scalp. <laughs> I'm a ticket scalper. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sounds like, sounds like you said S. You call you call my my lisp out right now. No, like, no, okay. No, no. So, anyways, I uh, yeah, I'm talking to somebody in in my DM, and he says, you know, I uh, I have really dry skin. What have you done about that? And so Dr. Squatch has a, a shampoo that has tea tree oil. So I used to get like the, they, I used to ma- get this brand that was just like pure tea tree oil and use it on that. And it, it does wonders for my head. And I know, and maybe Sal, you know, the like science better than I do on this, but I know that it's supposed to be great for like bacteria, fungus, Fungal. dry skin. Yeah. So all those things. Yeah. So a lot of people who have like dandruff, it's because they get this reoccurring kind of fungal yeah. infection on their scalp. So tea tree oil is a good natural, um, it's a natural alternative to like the chemical based, you know, and shampoo. it's, and it's normally a little expensive. So, I mean, so somebody who's, if you, if you have this issue and you're like, Oh my God, this is expensive. Well, it's cause it has that in that. Like if you were to buy tea tree oil by itself, it's expensive. So mm-hmm. if you have shampoo that has, that's its base, it's normally going to be, I've, I've been used to paying a higher price for that for a very long Does time. Does it feel tingly? Do you feel like like the, the fresh no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't do like that weird ting, which all that stuff is Isn't fake. Isn't that just a gimmick? It is yeah. gimmick. It's fake. It's like toothpaste, it's like, bro. Things are happening. Bubbly toothpaste <laughs> is fucking fake. That's not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So tingly tingly hair shit is is also fake. It's, if it's real and it has what it's supposed to have and it does what it's supposed to do. It's so. like the, yeah, when you get toothpaste and it foams up. Yeah. Like it's like you have to have it foam up for some reason. Is, yeah. that, why after, it work. is that why after shave burns? Do you think they do that on purpose? Sure. To make you well, feel there's like alcohol in it, right? So yeah, but why though? Know? I I don't know. Yeah, yeah I don't know about that's that about question. aftershave. I know that about toothpaste. I know that about tingly hair stuff. Like that stuff is all that is. It doesn't make a difference. Like mm. that's not. I don't know that. Yeah, it's not making any. You should know that. I had no idea about you're the, the tingly the, on the scalp. I think you're the first guy I ever seen put like baking soda on his toothpaste and, oh, yeah, or a toothbrush good, and brush his teeth with baking uh, yeah, soda. I've tried your your nasty toothpaste yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. yeah, baking yeah. soda yeah. and uh, activated charcoal. Yeah, that'll that'll that does black teeth. Uh, no, not when you wash it out. Yeah, if you leave it in your face. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like, you, looks like you, you bit the barbecue. Yeah, yeah, yeah I bet. No, Dude, I, oh, I was going to tell you guys, I finally like watched a real movie again, like in the theater. Oh, you went to the theater? Wait, theaters in open? In the theater, yeah. I, it, you know what? And it's it's only like certain locations. I guess there's like, they, they grade uh, areas like we're in the blue now in Santa Cruz. Like certain areas are still kind of whatever, red or orange or whatever the fuck. But uh, so- we were able to go and, and we watched and we're like, there were, really isn't that many good movies out, obviously, right now. But there was one that looked interesting. It was Tenant. Have you guys seen any of the previews for no, this or no, anything? No. Okay, so I didn't know anything to expect from this movie coming into it. And uh, like, basically, we were in there and it was it was immediately stressful. And it was just like, like just this onslaught of gunfire and, you know, like terrorist stuff. And I'm like, holy shit, like, it's not what I need right now. You know, <laughs> I'm like in there with other people. But I mean, it, the action was really cool and interesting and all this stuff. Christopher Nolan, the guy that did like Inception and oh, all yeah. that, I was like, oh, of course he directed this. Dialogue was horrible. Uh, they they put all their effort into like the effects effects and in, yeah. in the way because I hate movies like that, dude. The concept of it was so bizarre, dude. It's like you, basically like, and I'm not gonna ruin this for people that are gonna go see it or anything, but uh, like I didn't know the premise of it is basically like like they they were able to figure out like time travel and so like they they reverse and so you have like two different plots that are going in reverse and then going forward and then they interact with each other mm. and. 
and it's just like so confusing and like you leave the theater like what the fuck just happened oh. yeah now what was the experience in the theater did you have did they have to separate people you wore a mask like what's the deal yeah how, how what, what capacity was it filled it was like 20 percent. so oh. yeah so they had like taped off rows and then um if you go in there with a party like you just kind of stay with with you know the you know the party so it was like three of us but yeah there was there was like clusters of people spread out you have to wear a mask while you watch the movie and the whole thing no no we was well, that's true, they, they, you, they say, yeah, I mean, they, they check as you're coming in, but you know what I mean. Well, yeah, and then how are you going to eat your snacks? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. so you got to take the yeah. mask off. But the, the bar wasn't there anymore, and uh, that was a bummer. Mm. So it wasn't quite the whole same. reason why you go in the first place. Exactly. First question is from H&S Mama Snai. What is contralateral training, and who does it benefit? Oh, contralateral mm-hmm. training. So this would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, fellas, but essentially you are tr- you're like a, a built Bulgarian split stat squat or a lunge would be considered contralateral. Opposite arm, opposite leg direction. Like, yeah. Like so, walking. Walking so is contralateral. like a bird dog. Uh, yeah. Basically, like we're working like from one side to the other. Yeah. And essentially one side is working one set of muscle groups with one a recruitment pattern. The other side is working what would be considered maybe opposing mm-hmm. muscle groups uh, or opposing recruitment patterns. Why does this benefit people? Well, because we do a lot of things this way in real life. Uh, Every time you take a step, every time you step up something or grab something, very rarely is your whole body moving together the same way. You know, your arm swings forward, the other one tends to swing back. You step forward, one leg tends to be behind. And so it strengthens these kind of functional patterns. I also like this kind of training because it tends to highlight imbalances Mm -hmm. in me. So like if I did a lunge, I always I can tend to see uh, or feel one side being better in one position than the other. For example, my right leg forward might feel stronger, more stable than when my left leg is forward, and that can tell me a lot about areas I need to focus on. Yeah, I like using like crawling patterns uh, for this a lot, and I know it's it, not a lot of trainers utilize crawling patterns or like even get into these types of positions with bird dog and these types of things, but it's information. It's really like helpful information for me to see where the disconnect is, especially when there's a problem with, uh, you, you know, something with their walking, running, like anything with their gait, uh, being able to stabilize properly and also have that uh, communication uh, firmly established from right to left, left to right. Uh, is definitely beneficial when you get into functional movement. Well, I was going to say, contralateral training is extremely functional. Mm-hmm. It's uh, we crawl, we walk, we throw. Um, you you swing something. You t- yep. I mean, all these. It, it requires you to be able to do that for one side to communicate to the other side, and it also has a anti-rotational and rotational component to it many times. So. Mm-hmm. The, the functionality of training this way, I think, is extremely important for, you know, potential, you know, in, injury prevention, for just being better at everything that we do. So I always, so bird dogs were like a, a staple movement. Like I didn't do crawling patterns as much as a trainer. I didn't, I didn't get into like animal flow type stuff till later on or even curious about that stuff. But I see the value of it now. So like when I see somebody who does train that or teach clients that, I think it's got tremendous value to show people how to do that, um, but it belongs in it somewhat belongs in every routine, right? It, I think, and there's examples that a walking lunge would be that also, right? Yeah. So there's there's more basic exercises that people are familiar with uh, that are are already in your routine. Yeah, yeah, I think too. I mean, like people don't really consider coordination as much, and, and I know we want to build and develop our muscles, and we want to lose body fat and all that kind of stuff, but. You know, there's a lot of value with having like full control over your body and getting it to do what you want to do on command. And, you know, that requires a lot of this dexterity and, you know, like uh, coordination. And so to be able to kind of focus on that for a bit, like even if it's just in the very beginning when you're training somebody new, like how to better understand their body and like they didn't really you know, uh, they weren't exposed to that, like when they were younger or whatever, and we could still reestablish that. I think it's very valuable. Yeah. And especially if it, if it corrects imbalances or movement pattern issues in you, then it's going to help you develop a more aesthetic physique. You know, a lot of people, when we think of aesthetics, we tend to think about what bodybuilders will consider aesthetic or what magazine covers will consider aesthetic, but really the, the root of good aesthetics, at least real life good aesthetics comes from balance, right? It comes from the fact that I'm moving with good balance. Um, my muscles balance each other out. One area isn't overpowering another area. And so this kind of training 
besides making you move better, can actually contribute to having a physique that looks more aesthetic and balanced. And here's a good example of the opposite of that, right? We all know the the, the muscularly developed individual that doesn't seem very aesthetic. Although they have big muscles, they move around and they seem muscle-bound or clumsy. And so it reduces the aesthetic appeal of this person. Um, uh, MAPS Performance is one of our programs where you'll find contralateral type training. You'll find uh, this kind of functional-based training whose side effect oftentimes is an improvement in aesthetics. In fact, a lot of the like the gym-focused people who've gotten a program like MAPS Performance will comment and say, I, d I expected to move better. I did not expect to look better. But now that I move better, my body's starting to look better. It's because it's, it does a good job of identifying some of those weaknesses um, and imbalances in the body. You know, speaking of a, of an uh, activity like bird dog, bird dog isn't some great muscle building exercise, but could it contribute to exercises that are better at muscle building and make them more effective? Absolutely. That's the way you got to look at some of these exercises. Yes, there are exercises that are just the best, you know, muscle building, strength building exercises, but are there other movements that can unlock the potential of those exercises and make them more effective? Because it really doesn't matter if the squat is a phenomenal muscle building exercise. If your body is incapable of unlocking the, the full potential of a squat. Now, it doesn't matter that a squat is a great exercise. For you, it's not mm -hmm. because you have problems with movement. Contralateral training is one tool in the tool belt that helps unlock. It's part of that mobility uh, application. It's part of mobility. It's part of uh, improving activation of muscles. It's part of getting you to move better. And when you move better, you can train better. And when you train better, you look a lot better. Next question is from Kairos Captures. Are alkaline and pH water another processed item on the market, or are they worth the money? Here's a great example of taking, you know, maybe some applications of alkaline water and saying there may be some benefit, and then just you know doing it across the board, yeah, bastardizing it, it. Which is yeah. So okay, so alkaline five dollar bottle of water now, right? So yeah. water has I think normal water's pH <laughs> levels like eight. Eight or 8.5 or something like that. And something that's alkaline is over that. And oftentimes the way that they improve its alkali, you know, the, the alkaline quality of water is by adding certain buffering minerals to the water. So now, you know, water is a little bit more alkaline, meaning it will counteract some acidity um, in the body. What are the percent potential applications? Well, I guess if you have acid reflux issues, maybe it might help a little bit, in which case I'd say eat a Tums or a Rolaids, which is way more alkaline. It'll solve that that issue a little bit yeah, better. Yeah, or just eat, you know, like non-inflammatory foods. Yeah. Now, is it going to change the alkaline uh, of the, you know, the the measurements of your body? Probably not. Your body maintains its pH balance pretty damn good. That's how I thought they dispelled this, right? I yeah. thought they did, because that's how, the true way to test that this works is to drink this stuff and then like take a take a piss test, right? Isn't that how they would measure and like see if it's actually changing it? Yeah, your, your body is very, very good at maintaining a certain pH level because if it goes a little bit outside of that, even if it goes too alkaline or too acidic, it's not good. Bad. It can yeah. become quite dangerous. What you might get is a little bit more alkaline in your gut um, just like, you know, eating a, a calcium or magnesium, uh, product like Tums or, or Rolaids. Um, otherwise, well, just, just regular spring water. Like isn't it too, like most people that, and I know in my case, uh, specifically, like I'm not producing acid when I should be producing acid. And so that's really the biggest uh, problem that uh, I've been facing. And, and so it'll show up in, you know, at night or, or, or inopportune times where I'm needing to, to digest food. And it's, it's training that to, you know, my body to, to, to really get that response while I'm eating the food. Yeah. And I mean, here's the, here's the other side of it, right? If you drink water that is devoid of minerals and that's all you drink, you could cause electrolyte like dis imbalance. Like distilled? Yeah. Distilled would be the worst, right? If you yeah. just drink distilled water, you could cause problems right? because you're, 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 you're flushing out or causing, excuse me, causing imbalances with electrolytes. So just regular mineralized uh, spring water, tap water, believe it or not, is fine. pH water, you're spending more money for something that does nothing for you. And what if you're what if you're not producing enough acid and you throw more alkaline? You can actually make the problem. Well, yeah, I guess that's what I was getting at. Yeah, yeah you can make the problem worse. even worse. And, and this is what marketers do. They'll take something that everybody knows they need more of, like water, and they'll say, how can we 
inexpensive, you know, in a very inexpensive way, make it seem more valuable to buy our water. So they'll say our water's pH balance is higher. What they do? They added a little bit of, mm-hmm. you know, magnesium to it or something. Isn't like it that. interesting to you guys? Like, I want Doug. Do you have any idea? You're old. Do you have this? You probably should have a better idea. Of this <laughs> do you one. remember when uh, water? Would, yeah. No, I was mean invented. No, I mean I remember as a kid. I mean shit. We drank from the garden hose for at least half, you know, like a quarter of my life. I would say so. They didn't. There wasn't even before a, then. It was just hydrogen oxygen. Bottled water yeah. wasn't even a thing. Like you couldn't buy, you didn't go buy bottled water anywhere. Like that wasn't a thing. That was like, if you did, you were like storing for like. You were like rich. Only rich people bought like. Not I, even that. It was like because you're going camping or somewhere and you wouldn't be able to get to water. Maybe you bought the, but other than that, nobody bought water bottles. Like, right, Doug? Yeah. It was like you just no, drink. No, just drink it out of the tap, hose, right? right? Yeah. And so this has right. to be like a, a multi-billion dollar industry now that like, didn't even exist like 20 years ago. Oh, at the yeah. time I can remember when it first came on the market and I go, why would I pay for water? This is ridiculous yes, yeah, right we gotta start bottling up air uh, yeah. bro space balls remember yeah. in space balls? yes i know you're, they, gonna be, uh, you're gonna buy a can of air yeah you remember that oh i did yeah, buy a right. can of air. I, I think that's brilliant that's yeah. totally like the next move I think yeah you guys are onto something yeah, yeah no it's you know it's you know it's funny too is that bottled uh, water is one of the, the the largest contributors to waste because of all the plastic bottles so people are like, this is good, you know, it's healthy yeah. or whatever. You've got all these plastic bottles that we're dumping into. You know, those into, islands of plastic. Yeah, it's, um, you no, know, there's no there's no huge benefit. Just regular water is fine. Tap water is usually fine if you feel like you need to clean it further. Buy yourself a purifier so you're not, you know, wasting a bunch of plastic bottles. But pH water is largely a total gimmick. If you're a real gangster, you'll drink out of the garden hose. Yeah. Next question is from Land3 Emma. Is foam rolling good for recovery? And can it help you recover faster? Sure. Yeah, I think well, I love it for this. This actually. is so they do studies on massage. So that that would that's where you're going to find the studies that'll that'll point to this the best and say, okay, does massage help with recovery? Um, it's hard to measure that because there's perceived pain, in which case massage helps because you feel like you're less sore. Is it actually speeding up recovery? I don't know. I think it can, but not because it's it's it, the foam rolling or massage itself is reducing uh, the inflammation or making the recovery faster. I think the fact that you feel less pain, now you move more, and that is what I think facilitates recovery. Oh, that's an interesting theory. Yeah, because I know mm. I know if you just sit still, you're not going to recover as fast as so if you So I can move. see that from being restrictive, like after a workout, like I feel tight, or like, and, and you're less likely to uh, get that circulation that really yeah. is the part of the recovery process. But yeah, I don't know. Like it, it'd be interesting to see if you could like manually manipulate. Uh, uh, I don't know how. Well, you would, could test that. The way yeah. you would test that is you would actually you would massage a group of people and then they would lay in bed and do nothing, mm-hmm. oh. right? And then you would massage another group of people and they would go about their day. And then you would not massage somebody. That's who, and so all of them would need to be really sore, right? So the goal would be, you know, overtrain, overreach, get everybody like really sore, so legs, right? Real easy doing that with squats or something, right? So you get everybody really sore. You have one group that gets massaged and then goes about their day, so they keep moving around. You have one group that gets massaged, lays in bed, doesn't do anything, and then you have another group who doesn't do either one of them, right? And then you measure to see how, what the recovery process is. Yeah, what their performance yeah, is. Yeah, you know, the, the more I think about it, I think, Sal, your theory makes a lot of sense. Like, it's, it's probably less to do with the actual massage itself because, I mean, it's somebody who used to get massages all the time. I mean, that's what Katrina did, right, when we first met. Uh, you know, you you train and you're really sore. I mean, everyone's like trained legs, and then you had a day where you're just like, oh, you, yeah. you, you're oh. like shuffling around. Yeah, you're yeah. stiff when you move, and you so you 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 probably limit the amount you move around because of how sore you are. Versus, not, if, you've, if you've ever experienced a great massage like that, and you walk out, and you're like, oh my god, my hips are opened up, and you feel good, and you kind of go about walking. So that's probably you're probably right. The, the even if there is some science to support that it's doing something for recovery, it probably has more to do with the movement and the blood flow, oxygen, and nutrients getting uh, afterwards. Yeah. And right? it depends on how it's being done, like deep tis- tissue massage, or you know when people you ever seen those foam rollers that are like made out of wood, or when people go crazy with it, yes. with the, super with like the knobby one. Yeah, like when you go deep enough with I've massage, been CrossFit, uh, or you know foam rolling, you are causing damage. You uh-huh. are causing a little bit, not like when you're working out, but you can cause some muscle damage. I don't think that's going to speed up recovery. I, I really do think it has more to do with the fact that you, because the pain is reduced, just like stretching. I think stretching would do the same thing. Stretching gets me to move. 
trigger sessions. I think you're moving, you feel less pain, you move more. That facilitates recovery. Staying in bed, not moving due to whatever reason, whether it's because you're being lazy or because you're too sore, slows down recovery. It blunts the ad- uh, adaptation uh, signal. It blunts the muscle building signal because you're not moving. Like if you got really, really sore and then did not move at all, you you're, you might recover, but you're not going to build any more muscle because the signal you're sending from not moving is going to probably overpower the workout that you just did. You know, If I hammered my legs on Monday, didn't move till the next Monday, I guarantee I wouldn't get stronger. I'd probably get weaker. What is it called? Is it raking or reeking? The the, the Rake, most reiki? Uh, yeah, the most aggressive intervention that people do and they get all bruised. Rolfing. Rolfing, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, reiki is, uh, is like energy. Oh. Like they don't touch you. I went to the wrong guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why this is all like, you know. Uh, I thought you were supposed to weird. touch me. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't you going to put gloves on? Yeah. Uh, uh, when does the pain start, guys? Uh, Ham hocks. I can't keep my hands off of them. Yeah. <laughs> Next question is from Petro Julie. In your opinion, how credible is a personal trainer if they're not in their best shape at the moment? Yeah. In their best shape? That's a high high standard, right? You know, working with a lot of trainers, uh, I'll tell you the, the, okay, if you're really out of shape, it'll probably hurt your business. Of course. Yeah. Because people are going to look at you and judge your ability to train them. That's your business card. Yeah. But uh, look, uh, some of the most successful trainers ever, actually, all the successful trainers ever had, the most successful ones, none of them were the most ripped fit looking trainers they definitely worked out and they took care of themselves no because what comes with that is obsession and those people yeah. and that i think it's 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 rare but if you can find somebody who can keep themselves in extremely good shape and then also has tremendous amount of humility uh, around it uh i think that's a really dangerous combination as far as they'll be very probably successful but many times when we see a trainer who's absolutely jacked they're still dealing with insecurities that drove them in that direction to be that way and so they tend to be more cocky more arrogant they're less relatable and so it doesn't actually translate into more trainer sales as it is so having a nice balance right so if you've got a a, definitely a physique that someone looks at goes like oh he or she works out they look great or like that but maybe not so crazy that it's intimidating i think that's probably the sweet spot for like as far if we're talking about like business wise mm-hmm. for a trainer and yeah, the, was and- aria he's like the only one i've met that is like has a, like an insano physique but is still relatable and nice you know yeah it's the relatable part yeah that's a hard it's a hard combo i mean how do you relate even i had challenges relating some t- and initially when i first became a trainer because i i assumed that people hired me and were ready to jump into it with the fanaticism that I had. And it took me a second to figure out that most people don't want to work out all the time. They don't love it so much that they'll do it all the time. Right, right. I have to figure out how to relate to them and they have to, you know, to in, or, in order to communicate to them how to make this a part of their life. One, tra- I remember one time I, I, I uh, took a trainer or took a member off the floor and recruited them as a trainer. It was a member who lost 50 pounds coming to the gym, initially worked with a trainer, worked out on their own. By no means did they lose the 50 pounds and look like some you know, super ripped person. They lost 50 pounds and looked normal and relatively healthy. They didn't look like a crazy personal trainer. I recruited them, and that trainer did such a good job relating to other people. In fact, other people liked hiring him because he looked like you know, more like they did than like the super ripped trainers. And he did very, very well. I think you have to have a balance. I mean, I, I've talked a long, it's been a long time since I've brought this up on the show, but there was a time, I think it was like, I was on year five or six as a, as a fitness manager. And up until that point, uh, I just assumed that that had to be mandatory. Like I can't hire a trainer who's not fit. They need to be at like, they need to be really fit for most people that, that to, for me to even consider hiring them that originally. And then I thought, you know what? Like after I've been training trainers for such a long time. And then he met me. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe you were like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you were, you were fit. fit. You were a freaking football uh, player. So that you were still fit. Yeah. He was there. So I, no, layer, I'm talking like, on top of I'm me. talking about, I, I actually went to like an extreme level. I, I, I hired somebody that the average person wouldn't think worked out at all, but they had, they dropped a good 30, 30 plus pounds themselves. They had a good They'd story been on the journey. Yeah. They were, ex- they had, uh, they had experience, uh, is with, um, their, their education. They had a kines degree. They had got a national certification. So they had a good education level. They had experience losing weight, but definitely did not look the part. And so I went on this kick of like hiring some trainers that were like this to see how they would do. And being completely uh, uh, transparent, they didn't do very well. They had a hard time. They, they struggled with that because 
many people are very judgmental. Right? And a lot of people right away, if they want to change their physique, they want to be inspired by the person that, that's coaching them. But at the, to a point, they don't need to be so crazy ridiculous. They just need to be better than the person that's hiring them. That That's a challenge, right? If you're somebody who's like 20 pounds overweight and your trainer is 30 pounds overweight, it's really tough for you to get inspired by them, even if they've already had a big journey and they've lost it. And that's not to say, right. I don't want to discourage somebody who's in that situation that's having success. There's always exceptions to the rule. I've seen I've seen fat trainers do really really well. If you got a mouthpiece on you, you're likable. There you can overcome any of that. Mm-hmm. But there's there is a point that I think it it matters for a trainer to have an easier time being successful. That looking relatively fit I think is important. But also not being so so fit that you're not relatable because I think yeah. there's a part of people that want to see something that's actually kind of attainable too. Like if you see someone who looks like a cover model. Sometimes people just write it off like, I'll never look like that girl or that guy. Yeah, and also, I also, look, the most successful trainers I've ever worked with had the right attitudes. They really had a passion for health and fitness. Now, the side effect of that usually means that they're pretty fit because they believe what they're preaching. Right. So I don't know if it's necessarily, except for the extremes, the fact that they looked fit that attracted clients. I think it's more that they actually believed in what they talked about Mm -hmm. and the side effect of that being that they lived that lifestyle as well. And that's what made them successful trainers. Well, it's really, it's the passion. And it, it, the thing is, regardless of what they look like, if you can see like how much they're trying to, they've tried to improve themselves and like how passionate they are about fitness, uh, you know, that's going to come across. And so like, it, unfortunately, you're going to see that with some trainers that really don't put a lot of attention into themselves and they don't uh, take themselves that seriously. That's going to come across to, to the client. And so you just got to check yourself on that. Are you, you yourself trying your best to, you know, present yourself in a certain way? The consumer sometimes too is like they don't know what the hell they're looking at like i've had trainers that don't look super fit like they're not ripped they don't have abs uh, and maybe they're carrying a little bit of extra body fat but shit they're mobile as hell they're strong as hell like they have other attributes that they right. care they care less about the way they look they're like i'm not hung up on trying to be you know single digit yeah. body fat percentage but they're they're deeply passionate about mobility and strength mm-hmm. and being functional and so maybe the average consumer who's been marketed to all the time by these billboards or ads and magazines of this is what a trainer should look like, they assume that, oh, this is what, if they don't look like this, they're a lazier or less intelligent type of a trainer, which that couldn't be further from the truth. Because there's many right. times there's trainers that actually are very secure with who they are. They don't give a shit about comparing themselves to the next guy or tra- guy or girl that's you know super ripped. They care about the other aspects of health and fitness. And until you meet that trainer, get to talk to them, you may not know that. So that's I would good, caution consumers. And that's a good point because the, then you look at the opposite. Like a, a consumer who doesn't know any better may look at someone who's shredded and think, oh, that's a good trainer, not realizing that that person has bad relationship with food, they severely restrict themselves, or they binge when a show is over, that they have zero balance in their lives, they're fanatics to the point where it's unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And so looking at them, you're like, that person understands how to help me develop a lifelong relationship with, <laughs> right. with fitness and health, when in reality, that person doesn't even know how to do it for themselves, let alone do it for another client. And some, And I've seen those trainers and I've seen the way that they train their clients, and it's like they tr- the way they train themselves. Here's your meal plan. Follow yeah, this. Stick yeah. to it. Here's your cheat days. Eat whatever you want. This is when you can go off. Oh, here's how you're going to restrict your, your water because you're going on, to the beach. And I'm like, what are you teaching your client? Right. This is yes. not the way to, to, to you know produce success with people. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Doug, the producer, at Mind Pump Doug. You can find Justin, everyone's favorite, at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. It's not always more is better. And I think that's the the message that everybody's always heard about burning body fat is like, you know, you can't do enough. And, you know, that's just not true once you do an inventory of all the stress you're already accumulating. No, look at your strength. You know, look, MAPS Anabolic, which I said was for people who have some experience. You can do that program two days a week. Two days a week. But